we are now on to topic number four. We looked at the area of product management yesterday. So today we are on to the second P of marketing, which is pricing. And in terms of your MBA plus that we are talking about, the pricing uh, discussion will cover the core area of economics, uh, core area in the MBA, which is economics. Okay, so we will look at a number of economic principles in this area. So the importance of the pricing decision cannot be overemphasized. It has been always the conventional marketing accounting link. Pricing has basically the traditional accountant helps the pricing decision by quoting, manufacturing, and selling costs. We were asked in the old days to calculate the cost of goods sold and the closing inventory. But really, it is not enough for us to just to calculate those costs. We know that even in the calculation of those costs, there are some problems with the traditional or activity based costing. But just cost was never enough. Okay, for proper marketing decisions, it fails to consider customer reactions to different price levels and how these reactions affect the customer decision to buy or not buy. Prices must be reasonable in order to maintain a sales level against competition, but yet yield a satisfactory profit. So we can't go too high because of competition, and we can't go too low because of the fact that we have to make a profit. So the pricing policy must reconcile these conflicting needs. This line is it required? Not that slide is also a problem. I will keep this slide on. Okay. Okay. So the pricing this is in a complex one. Okay, because of these two extremes and difficult mistakes are difficult to rectify. Okay, so let's look at the how low can you go. Theoretically, the internal lower limit in the short run is marginal cost, that is your variable cost. You can't go below your variable cost, but I have said, but not always. And why that is, is something that we looked at yesterday, penetration pricing, you may need to even go at a Margin. Price less than marginal cost, which means a loss in order to obtain large market share for market penetration purposes. Okay, so we are not too sure about how low you can go. What about how high can you go? The upper limit. This is set by a multitude of external factors, such as the value of the product to the buyer, the range of buyer choice, the number of buyers and sellers in the market, the degree of buying skill for certain aspects, substitutes, and the image of the product. So let's look at the first one, the value of the product to you. Okay. Now let me look at this bottle of water. I promise you it's not open. It may be open, but anyway. This bottle of water, if I was to offer it to you all, how much are you willing to pay for this at the moment? What, you actually going to pay me one kilo for this? No, it's not it's not if it is not open. If it is not open, you will be paying one kilo. Why? You have the water in front of you. So does this have anything left? <laughs> I need, are you, you're giving me like charity. <laughs> okay, forget okay, about charity. What is the value of this bottle of water to you at the moment? Zero. 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 At the moment, zero. Okay, but supposing you were coming out of the desert, after about three or four days, and I gave you not only this water, but this half drunk bottle of water, you then given me your wife, your house, your car, and everything. <coughs> so you can see the value is quite different depending on the context in which you are being offered this. Okay, at the moment it has no value, but in a different context it has a significant value. So this value is contextual. Now we can't, of course, get you all to get you all to uh, have go coming out of the Sahara Desert all the time, okay? But we need to get some sort of context on your head. 
inside your head that you would really want this product. And that is what we do with things like brandy that we will show you. So at the moment, or maybe even after you come out of Sahara Desert, you really don't care about what the brand is. You just want the water. In other situations, you really don't care about the water. You want to be seen having the brand. So these are things that we are going to consider today. Okay, so these upper limit things. Okay. How can we sort of capture the totality of this, uh, all these factors, the value of the product, the buyer choice and so on. But yesterday, I was telling you about economics and remember I told you that the pricing decision, the economy said that that's where the demand curve cuts the supply curve and not to think about that nonsense. But today, I'm going to actually give you something that is useful in economics. And that is this concept of elasticity of demand. This is a very good concept that comes from economics, elasticity of demand. So let's look at what that is. <coughs> so essentially, you can draw the demand curve, price and volume. But the demand curve, we know it slopes in this direction, but what if it slopes quite flat. That means that very small changes in price can bring about a big change in demand. So extremely small changes in price can bring a big change in demand. In other words, if you put the price up, you lose all the business. You put the price down, you get all the business. This is called an elastic demand curve. An elastic demand curve. Okay. Now, in contrast to that, you have you have a situation where you can again draw the demand curve. What is elastic situation? Okay. In this case, of course, the demand curve is <coughs> quite steep. Okay. So big changes in price bring about only small change, I've not drawn this well, but small change in volume. So this is called an inelastic demand curve. Okay, doesn't matter how high you put the price, people still want it. Now there are two types of commodities that actually fall into this. These are your everyday items that really there's a lot of competition so you can just go to someone else. But these ones fall into two categories. One would be our necessities in life. We need petrol. Today we need our phone to be in contact with everyone. So that is why uh, petroleum companies or telecommunication companies can, if they are allowed, put the price up to whatever they want and still people will want their business. So here you have governments have to appoint regulators to make sure that these companies are not unduly profiteering because of this need by the consumers. So that is the type of product that is a necessity. On the other hand, the other extreme of an inelastic demand curve would be a high branded luxury item where no matter what you do, people want those products, those who want it, want it. And in fact, you might find in that case a demand curve the opposite direction, higher, more you more you price it, the more the demand is. Okay, in those sorts of products. I mentioned a little bit about the Rolex watch, which we are talking about. Higher the price, more they want. Burberry bag, I mentioned that. Thousand dollars, people want it. At five hundred dollars, not so much. At hundred dollars, definitely no one will want that bag. Okay, so these are the sorts of things that we can capture in this elasticity of demand. Now, of course, the government influence will also be taken into consideration, and that is where the regulator comes in, in very many industries. Okay, so now, in many textbooks, you will find when they discuss pricing, they combine a method of pricing and a pricing strategy. Some of them actually do separate it out, but I have seen many of them sort of mix in these two. But we are going to separate it out. What is the pricing method? And within that method, what are the strategies available? So let's look at the 
pricing methods first. The universal method of pricing that companies use is cost plus pricing. Okay. So first one is cost plus. Now essentially what this means is that you find the cost. We now know that that is not easy because how are you allocating your cost? Is it based on traditional IABC? But anyway, once you find the cost, you put up a profit margin. This can be an average profit margin, if I say about 30%. This could be a profit margin that is 2,000% more than cost, if you want to do skimming. Or you may decide to go minus 80%, sell at a loss, if you want to do market penetration. So you can see that this area here is your strategy. Okay, how much you are going to put it up would be your strategy. Okay, so we will talk about strategies later, but once you get the cost, then the strategy's decision will be your markup, the plus. This is the standard almost universal method of pricing. It's based purely on internal costs. This method is adequate in fairly stable markets and in basic costs are known. It's commonly used by retailers and wholesalers who know what their basic costs generally are. If you're not a manufacturer, most often this is okay. I'm not saying it's great, but it's okay because you're starting with a base of cost that you understand. The retailer knows exactly how much it's costing them to have the product on the shelf. But if you're a manufacturer, then of course, it's a different matter. Manufacturers have many methods by which they calculate basic costs, such as absorption or marginal costing. That's how they allocate the overhead and increasingly allocating costs based on activity based costing. Okay, the next method is target pricing. Now target pricing is something that the reverse we've already talked about. Remember I told you that if you get your selling price that you think you can sell it for, remove a percentage profit margin, then you must make the product at a certain target cost, okay, with value engineering. That is a good cost control mechanism. But co uh, target uh, uh, target uh, pricing is simply the old method of finding your cost, okay, adding on a percentage rate of return. This is the rate of return, and that means that is the price that you want to sell it at. So there's absolutely no cost control here. It is simply taking your cost and adding on a rate of return rather than a profit margin. So it's really not another costing method. Okay, this is the most sophisticated version of cost plus, takes into account volume fluctuations and the cost of capital involved in the business. This method defines a definite rate of return on an investment for a certain period. To fix this, one must be able to forecast in a particular period, the sales level, the knowledge of the products life cycle is needed for this and the average cost during a particular period. But remember that target pricing basically <coughs> does not look outside your own walls, purely based on your cost, internal cost, and not on the market, thus takes very little account of competition. So I'm not going to put it as a separate method, it's a variation of cost plus. The next method is definitely a different method competitive based pricing. So let's put that down. Competitor based. So here what you will do is, you look at the competitor's price and you can do head on, exactly the same as the competitor, or a percentage above, or a percentage below. So this uh, over here, would be your strategy. But the method is looking always at the competitor's price. Okay, they're basically fixing a price that slots into the market's competition <coughs> and external factors are specifically considered. This method is needed in highly competitive markets where price sensitivity is so great that anyone 
moving about the growing rate is going to go bankrupt. There is two sub methods in competitive based pricing. Head on pricing, where the price is set exactly at what the competition is offering, and percentage differential pricing, where one bases one's own price on a percentage difference, either higher or lower, from that of the level of competition. Okay, so this one is a little bit more sophisticated because you do still look at your costs, but you are looking particularly at the competition. In normal conditions, this method becomes very mechanistic and does not allow managers to build on their products or companies' unique strengths or adopt for their unique weaknesses. So you may have certain capabilities. We talked about capabilities yesterday that enables you to do something better, but if you are simply looking at the competition, you can't leverage those capabilities. The problem period is when one needs to change the price of a product for reasons other than those caused by competition. Such reasons may be increased cost of your materials or your uh, ingredients, or maybe low market penetration. There is not enough recognition of your product. Okay, so these are the problems where you purely look at the competitor's price. Now the last method is what's called customer-based pricing. Here we look at not only the competitor, but also the customer. But today, the terminology that they use is value-based pricing. Remember I asked you about the value of the bottle of water? So that sort of pricing based on value is now the new thinking that's going on in the pricing area. So here, the analysis takes into account not only the internal cost factors and competition, but also the value customers place on the product. Now, as you just saw, value is very difficult for an accountant to quantify because it is contextual. At what point are we offering this product? Fortunately, the opportunity for the application of customer-based pricing has been advanced by the emergence of new conceptual techniques. Essentially, a product has several different values. There is the cost value. That is the sum of all the costs incurred in providing the product. Let us assume that you've got the calculation and allocation right. Then we have the cost value. Okay. Then there's the exchange value, which is the price that the customer is willing to pay. The price of purchase we offer for the product, this is the conventional purchase price. But that price itself is a sum of two parts. Okay. There is a use value, which is the price, which is the price the purchaser will offer in order to ensure that the purpose or function of the product is achieved. So when I offered you the bottle of water after you came out of the Sahara Desert, the function was that you wanted to drink some water. That is the use value. So in that case, your exchange value, which will be very high because it's your house, your wife, and your car, but it's okay, it's all to do with drinking the water. But in other situations, it is not only the use, it is also the esteem value, okay, which is the price which is offered for the product beyond its use value. So that is where you'll be looking at the brand. Okay, it is beyond the use. So let us take this shirt that I'm wearing that I purposely wear when I give this lecture. Uh, Shaki is not here, he reminded me that I had to wear this shirt today. Okay. Uh, he has followed the lecture correct time and knows all my jokes as well. Anyway, this shirt, I hope, is reasonably stylish, the matching tie. Okay. So, the use value of this shirt is the fact that I can come and give you a lecture, okay, and be reasonably professional when I give the lecture and it covers me up okay. That is the use value. The cost value, the cost value will be all the thread count that went into making this shirt, okay. The uh, dyeing and all of that, that would be the cost value and all the transportation and everything that was incurred to bring it to the point of sale. So what is the steam value? The steam value is this little polo horse, the logo, which is just get up and show the people that logo, okay? You can find another that's but okay, we talk about that. So this logo, what is the cost value of this? 
the thread count 0.0000001 cent, isn't it? Okay, but because it is there, I'm going to pay you more money for this. My exchange value will be higher, even if it is a copy. Okay, even if it is a copy, the price of the copy shirt with the logo versus without the logo will be higher. Okay, so without that, you would have not paid even five euros. Okay, <laughs> I don't know if you are telling the truth or not, but anyway, it looks pretty good for, for a copy, right? Anyway, so you can see the difference that we are our esteem value, our branding goes beyond use, and in some instances, that could be significant. That's why you're paying one thousand dollars for a Burberry bag, which is the use is almost. I saw that bag, I was so shocked, not even a zip. Okay, it's just basically a shopping bag with a Burberry label all around it. Okay, but people want to pay the thousand dollars, and that is purely esteem value. The use value of that will be ten dollars. Okay, so this is where we are going to now try to understand this, the esteem value especially. So when you are looking at customer base, you can see it is going to be average esteem. Low esteem, high esteem. Why is it that today Apple is still able to command a significant higher price for its iPhone than Samsung? Samsung does have the market share advantage, but still people want to pay more for their iPhones. Okay simply because that's the one that is recognized as being the one you like to carry around and show off, the esteem value. Right, so I can't find the cap of that, it disappeared somewhere, the esteem value there. Okay, so this is essentially what the situation is. There are these three things that we have to think about. So in equation four, Profit ex equals exchange value minus cost value, and exchange value is use value plus esteem value. Now, the cost value, the cost the customer perceives, are very diverse. Okay, now, in an industrial situation, there can be a number of different things that come into cost. They include clearly defined acquisition costs, such as the seller's price, incoming freight, installation, or the handling cost. And less clearly defined costs such as the risk to the customer of product failure, the fear of late or inadequate delivery, the fear of custom modification after we see the item and so on. That is why yesterday we talked about after sales service and providing some warranties and so on so that you can reduce this risk. What about the use value? It is a subjective judgment and we differ depending on the decision maker. Even the use value. In an industrial buying situation where there are many people influencing a decision, there can be different aspects to the subjective judgment. For example, the functional utilitarian benefits might be attractive to the production engineers. So those are the features. The operational benefits related to the production reliability and durability will be important to the manufacturing and operating managers. On the other hand, the financial benefits we be attracted to the purchasing agents and accountants. So you can see that different people have a different interpretation of use, features, ease of operations, and the money. Okay, so in the industrial buying situation, it's a team decision, a team decision, and therefore you could have a fair amount of subjective judgments. It's not an easy one. The cost value of a trade-off an industry buyer makes in arriving at a use value is an exceedingly complex process involving perceptions and not merely hard and fast realities. The consumer product buyer also goes through a similar process. Features, ease of operation, price. But luckily, it is a single person making a decision. One figure, not a team decision. So in our heads, we will say, yeah, I think this is worth about so much. Okay, so that is, essential. so again, another little prop I bring for this lecture is this watch that I have, okay? So this watch, okay, has no place to wind the time, 
no type. Okay, you can't change the type. So what you have to do is you have to there's all these cities around the world around this watch face, including Dubai. And you have to press a but two buttons and get the uh, pointer to Dubai. You press another button and the thing turns turns round, takes into account daylight saving and all of that, and gets you the time. Okay, so it's a fantastic watch. Keeps track of all the time. Now of course the, the iPhone does that anyway for you through the GPS, but this is all mechanically programmed. Okay, so that's the features of Fantastic. You've got double time and alarms and all of those sorts of things. The features are fantastic. But ease of operation, a bit difficult. I had to remember which button to press first and what button to press next before I can set the time. So the difficult in operations. But the price? Well, the similar watch tag here was about $3,000 and the alarm was not even very loud. This is a Seiko that I got in Malaysia for about $400. Okay, so for me, the brand tag here was not that important as the use value and the features and the fact that the price was only $300 to $400. Okay, so you can see that I went through all those same things. Okay, and all of you when you are purchasing, do go through those factors and you make a decision accordingly. So it's, a, it's not a team decision. Okay. Esteem value. In a purchasing situation, the customer will take the seller's price, exchange value, less the use value to arrive at the esteem value. So esteem value is price was <coughs> minus use value. If the value is say 100,000, one must ask the question, is the product requires so much that I am willing to pay 100,000 in excess of its use value? Now in Australia, those who are thinking of a Mercedes Benz top of the line car, the Maybach, have to pay $900,000 in Australia, maybe much more over here. A Rolls Royce top of the range is 1 million Australian dollars. So the difference is 100,000. And those who want the Rolls Royce, they say 100,000 is nothing to commit to drive a Rolls Royce. The fact that Rolls Royce is now owned by BMW is a different story, but they will want that prestige. So this is the difference. Okay, so let's look at an example here of how we can make use of this. Okay. Now this is, these are typical features of a car that you would find. Okay. Uh, hope you have any, some more features that you want to add. But sunroof, alloy wheels, leather seats, etc., etc. All sorts of features of a car. And in Australia, you do get advertisements like this, where they show you, okay, these are what a Mercedes-Benz C250 will have, these are what a BMW 320i will have, and the company that is advertising, in this case the Nissan Maxima, is, it, is the word Maxima sold here, or they do it under a different brand? Maxima. Maxima is there, right. So the Nissan Maxima, of course, they will make sure that what they show here as the use value or features is all ticks. Okay? So what they're trying to say is, look, we're giving all this, the other cars are not giving this, couple of crosses there, and look at our price versus the competition price. Okay, in uh, Australia, always, for some reason, the Mercedes Benz has a slightly higher premium than the BMW. Uh, across the world, I have noticed that that is the case. Of course, Mercedes-Benz is uh, aligned a little bit in the old days with the older buyer, while the BMW was a younger buyer. But these days, Mercedes-Benz is coming out with cars for the younger buyer as well. Uh, what is the view in Dubai? I know that I shouldn't ask certain people who own BMWs, but what is the news? Okay, what is the view? Mercedes versus BMW, what is a slightly higher prestige value in Dubai? Same. Same, is it? <laughs> I used to have a, a Mercedes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you agree? Both the same. Both the same, right. But in many, many markets, this one has a slight premium advantage. Okay, but look at that difference. So, is it worth, look at what Nissan is saying. But if, BM, if Mercedes takes this, what it can do is this. It can say, okay, how much will it pro do we have to spend at cost to provide all these options that Nissan is providing. 
So we will option up the car, that is all the excess, we will option it up. Let us say at first another 15,000. Then what do we have that Nissan has listed here? What do we have? Okay, that will take away. Okay, so that now we have a car, a Mercedes-Benz car at Nissan's, that is exactly the same as the Nissan in terms of use value or features. So Nissan's price was 35,000. That means that relative to Nissan, the esteem value of a Mercedes-Benz is 30,000. Of course, it will be different compared to the BMW because you deduct the BMW here and you get a different value. So it's a relative thing. The esteem value relative to something else. So that's a useful computation to know, okay, that is what customers we are going to pay us for having the privilege of our three-pointed star in the front of our car. Okay. What do you think of that sort of computation? Okay. It sort of gives an idea of what we are paying beyond the use. So that's why for me, it didn't matter that I had a Seiko brand or a Tacchio. For me, there was no relative difference. For me, the use was the most important thing, but for others, it certainly will go with the Swiss watch brand. Okay, in a market situation, as we are trying to determine price to charge a prospective customer, that is the exchange value, both use value and esteem value will have to be estimated. Most of the methods used in behavioral and motivational research have been aimed towards such estimation. I have shown you a little example of a relative computation from Mercedes-Benz. The important above for the accountant is that he or she must know the highest exchange value the customer would be willing to pay for the product. It is only once this is known that he or she can structure a pricing policy that will take maximum advantage of the company's internal cost structure and build wherever possible on the company's distinctive competitive competence. Now, you go and talk to many car uh, manufacturers, uh, you talk to them privately, <coughs> they will tell you that in terms of the quality of the product, the quality of the component and so on, there's very, very little difference between a European car, a Japanese car, or even a Korean car. I mean, these days, the quality is pretty much up there. So the difference really comes to how well you promote the brand and how you have the perception of the brand in front of the person's head. So many of these behavioral things we are going to look at in more detail tomorrow when we are looking at promotion, advertising and promotion. Okay, how to get these people involved in a certain feeling that they want. Okay, that's really to do with the esteem value. So use value in similar products, very, very similar, especially in the prestige markets, especially in the uh, certain markets like the car market. Okay, now let's look at strategies. Okay, so how do we come up with these numbers over here? One, we've already come across to the two extreme strategies, and that is your skimming and your market penetration. Okay. Skimming, where you come down the demand curve, taking the cream out of every level, and penetration pricing, where you get your brand recognized and then as you get more and more recognition of your quality and your reliability, you can move up the demand curve. So skimming is short-term profit maximization. It generally applies to new products with unique character and therefore with a demand curve that is relatively inelastic. The price can be kept high so that the demand can behave within the limits of production. The market is effectively segmented on an income price basis. <coughs> Income is therefore very high initially because your margins are incredibly high okay, and then you slowly bring it down. The strategy may be used for uncertain future demand, quick investment recovery, especially if you don't know that the product is going to be uh, successful in the longer term. And as a hedge against setting a bad price because it is always easier to reduce rather than increase price. As I told you, it's much easier to come down from a bad high price than to go up from a bad low price. The price is lowered and each segment is exhausted. Now, in contrast to that is 
market penetration, short term low price market penetration. Now this is for both new and existing products. You can use market penetration for new products, but under conditions where there is keen competition and a price sensitive market. So very much a situation where there is an elastic demand curve. In skimming, it's mainly an inelastic demand curve because you have such a differentiated product that there is not much of competition. You can charge what you want. Prices are kept deliberately low, even negative or near profits, in order to capture a good slice of the market, which the Japanese did after World War II in America. Then, within these two, there are a number of other strategies. One, and many of these you all know, I will just put in the technical term for these. One is product line pricing. This forms part of penetration strategy for penetration but need not apply only to new products. This strategy is based purely on the concept that different products pull others. Thus the whole product line is seen as a single unit. And as long as the average revenue of the entire line is above average cost, the profit loss situation of the individual product within the line are ignored. Okay. So this is the area where there is this concept of loss leaders. To make a brand familiar, it may make be good by the others in the line that are highly priced. So these days, you have so many concepts with this loss leader. I mean, the Windows software I mentioned, which is a good example of a loss leader, virtually given free with the computer you're purchasing, but all of the other things like Office and so on come with it. And these days, all of the apps that you get on your iPhone and so on would be loss leader. You get the basic version for $1 or even free. Okay, and then you get used to it, then you get the more premium version that you download. So Skype would be a good example of that. They provide that technology free, but then provide it at a higher price uh, through the Skype premium and so on. So there are so many examples of this loss leader these days. Then you have variable pricing. Similar, again, is another variation of penetration pricing. Prices that may vary according to outside factors such as seasons, regionality, and raw material availability. Any examples of that? Of variable pricing? Should we come across a lot of things? Hotel prices, airline prices, okay, you can be high season, low season, therefore the year's profit is seen as a whole, and the product is expected to return an average profit. Okay, these days the airlines are like, you know, um, you don't know exactly what you're paid because the guy next to you had paid something completely different to you when you're flying on the plane and see, okay? And the Ryanair, uh, I mean, you can purchase tickets these days for one pound sterling to fly between Europe, uh, Britain and Europe, but then you pay for everything else, including carrying your baggage, um, uh, customs, all, uh, not customs, uh, baggage handling, um, uh, weightage, food, all of that, you have to pay extra. And Ryanair, about a year or two years ago, said that they even go to think about charging for using the toilet on the aircraft. Okay, but he says that after all, uh, these toilets are clean, uh, just like any other toilet on the ground, so why shouldn't people pay money to use the toilet? Okay, so that's an interesting uh, thing. I don't think he has gone through with it, he's just got a lot of publicity. So high price periods, regions, etc. make up for the low price periods, regions in that year. Then we have something that is really based on customer based pricing, okay, a psychological esteem based view, and that is odd pricing. Okay, now we will know for some reason the way that our brains are wired that we give far more emphasis to the first digit than any other digit that follows. So we think that $29.99 is $20 rather than $30, although there's only one cent difference. So $29,990 is much cheaper than $30,000 and so on. We give, okay, now even though I've given this lecture many times, I still have to force myself to think of the number as a higher number like that. Okay, so that's the way we are, brains are wired. There's a significant drop when you go from 29 to 30 in terms of the volume. Okay, so that is 
an interesting method that is used often. You see it happening all the time, okay, where this psychological method is coming. Interestingly, um, they've done a lot of experiments about the way our mind works, okay. They're given, uh, I've seen this test done in the English language, and I presume it can be done in any other language, but they're given an entire page consisting of three or four paragraphs with lots of sentences where every single word was misspelled except that the first letter and the last letter was correct and the number of letters was correct but the letters were all jumbled in the middle and everyone read the whole page without any problems very fast okay because they were not reading from left to right they were reading whole images and images are easy to recognize so they have now extended this because they have taught a baboon <coughs> how to read 700 words, to recognize 700 words. Okay, so they tested the guy and he was able to, he doesn't know what it means but he can recognize the word. But then they jumbled up the words and gave it to him and he read it as easily as we do. Okay, so it's interesting that their brains are, appear to be wired very similar to ours. Okay, so it's interesting. Here's another one, prestige pricing. This is the Rolex example. See, this is the normal demand curve sloping in that direction. Rolex put its prices up and the demand curve went in the other direction. Okay, price as an indicator of quality. Good things no cheap, cheap things no good. Okay, so price taken as an indicator of quality. But then you come down to this level here. Now that was interesting because one of the best learning exercises that I had was when I did my MBA at Bradford and I was taken to the Morrison supermarket by my marketing lecturer, the whole class. And we, he had got permission for us to sell carrots in the supermarket and they were beautiful Yorkshire carrots and we were asked to put the price down, if I remember right, every 15 or so minutes. Right? And as we put the price down, of course, more people came and bought carrots. But then we put the price down so much, the people looking at the carrots and say, something must be wrong with this. Okay? So price as an indicator of quality. It's interesting. Now about, probably about four years ago, we had a person in this class, okay, who was in the fashion industry. He had about two or three uh, years of fashion of last year, year before that, that he could get rid of. He discounted, 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 but he couldn't sell anything. And then he came and listened to this, okay, and he went and he put his price up about 200 to 300% for fashion that was about three years old. And he sold his stock immediately. He came and thanked me, okay, because again, price is indicator of quality. Very, very easy in the fashion industry where you really don't know much except the fact that you're looking at a high price or a low price. So discounting doesn't work in that industry. <coughs> if the price is very high, if the item is considered prestigious, the Rolex watch company initially meant the Japanese watch was set but raised the price of their mechanical watches. It's high exchange value, which is called price exclusivity, and image building promotion has given to very high esteem value. Such pricing strategy will not work for all products, for example, increase the price of video recorders will not help in a market dominated by DVD players. Now, these days, they stopped making about two or three years ago video recorders. And most likely, they are going to stop making this also very soon. So you can't expect to put the price up of a video recorder and make a sale. However, if you wait long enough, you might be lucky. Now, the, when the CD player came out, the record player, do some of you even know what a record player is, the younger people? Okay, the record player where you have a needle, okay, on a vinyl disc, they were giving it away free, no one wanted it. Okay, but today, they realize that the sound that the vinyl disc makes is different to the CD sound and closer to what the original artist wanted. So the record players these days are going for $500 to $1,000, what they couldn't even get rid of some years ago. Okay, so it's become an antique item. Okay, I'm not too sure that the same video recorders, but who knows. 
Okay, so these are the things. If you wait long enough, of course, these things come back into fashion. Okay. <coughs> Next is price cutting. This is very much the situation with the elastic demand curve. Elastic <coughs> demand curve. Studies that most frequently encounter the struggle against competition. It represents the deliberate attempt to undermine the existing established price and either steal a market, a market the competitor, or drive him from the market. It's a negative approach, and unless a company has made the price cut from a position of strength and has anticipates growth in the market, in the total market. If this is not the case, it can generate into a price war with progressively lower margins. So you cut the price, they cut the price, you cut the price, they cut the price, and everyone loses. So you have to be in a position of strength to drive the other person from the market. Okay, so these are the different pricing strategies. Many of these are familiar to you, but we've shown it in the context of the demand curve and the elasticity of demand. So just as a matter of interest, uh, SAFE, um, in your components, aircraft components business, what sort of pricing do you do? Is it competitor based? You look at the competitor's pricing or is there any special capabilities that you have that you can price it above the competition? Uh, do people want your product compared to the competition? What, what do you think? Yes, this one is competitor, exactly. As you all people can understand, we are competitor with Tanzania, SRP, Switzerland, and aircraft. We see it there, so we set up the call and price based on what they provide it, or what the, the capabilities allow when they maintain this component. What they provide, uh, the gar warranty, guarantee for this component, how long, what alone when we do this maintenance for each component, what the additional service provided for this component. So it's very competitive, but as benchmark, we, are go, uh, we go aligned with Lufthansa and SRT. Okay, now Lufthansa and SRT, are they, are they, are you doing head-on pricing or are, do they have a slightly higher esteem value no, to your? <coughs> Lower than, lower than. So you're going percentage lower, okay? Because of the labor uh, cost, then it's cheaper than. The okay, so you're going percentage lower because you can provide it lower, or is it because your name is not as well known as Lufthansa? No, actually, uh, as from uh, Lufthansa, it's actually more than well known than our company. Okay. That means we now work on to keep that in the top. So okay, now so worldwide, is our company is ranking ten okay. worldwide. So you can see they are a combination of cost, they have a cost advantage, but also the fact that their esteem value is lower indicates that it really has taken all these three into account. Okay, Cost is lower, but then the competition is very strong with a higher esteem value. So that these are things that have been taken into account. Let's look at the credit card company, Dubai One. What do you think, how do you price your product? We have different prices. Okay. Different products for different prices. Okay. So when you come to credit cards, it will depend on the salary mainly we are just targeting. So we have low salary scale, middle class premium. So based on that, we are just targeting different different products. Okay. Like, a, uh, like small scale salary, standard, like... Uh, okay, so you are looking mainly at the customer. Do you look at the competition? Yeah, definitely. Competition in the area, so... Market share is same, but there's so many are here, so only that. So what do you think? You have a higher esteem than the competition or what's your view? See, it depends on how many factors will be there. No, no, so we have to, <laughs> you finally come up with a price, you have to consider all these factors. So, um, mainly as a customer, when you are going, you will see the promotions that you offer. Yeah. So when you purchase whatever you pay, you will get from out of this card and you will consider. If you go to a normal, you buy it, have to take great card privacy, what benefits are I get. So based on that, we are focusing. So would, the, would, would a person, for example, American Express, uh, around the world cost more than Visa and MasterCard and is accepted in less shops, but still people want to carry the American Express card. Why is that? Esteem. Esteem value. The use is, in fact, even lower. All right? Any other examples you want to give from your own companies that you wish to? Yes? Uh, actually, I come from Pelican. A okay. German brand. Okay. So we always uh, compare our pricing with European brands. Now, since it's a stationary product, we have the TCO pricing, which is variable, 
as well as the regional pricing because we are distributing for Middle East, Africa and South markets and all these GDP and purchasing power parity is different. So we have to keep a pricing related to these markets. So we have seasonal because uh, back to school season is the main okay. income okay. for us and that is only for four months of the year and that is giving us more than 50% of the turnover. So that is taken into consideration and regional because of the purchasing power. Which country has a different purchase. If you want to sell the same stationary product in GCC country, the pricing is very high mm. and the same product going into India will be very less. Okay, yes, yes. Uh, so what you want to is not? Yeah. Okay. The school product. Yeah. Because back to, school is, back to school is very important for us and that's giving us the major turnover. Otherwise, you have office products also that is 12 months later. Same. Yeah. When you do back to school and yes, seasonal is there, but what about your competition? Competition is also the same. If you have a higher esteem value to your competition, do people want your product more? No, that is what I said. We only compare with European brands. Okay. But so the European brands are available? Yes, yeah, it is available here. In fact, uh, this product is a competitor for us, Stedler. Okay. okay. You have Stabilo, you have Weber Castle, right. you have BIC. Yes. And uh, coming to Pelican, you have high end writing instruments, which we are competing with uh, Mont Blanc, yes. uh, Monte Grappa, uh, Caran right. So there, People are not ready to pay for Pelican because they always prefer to have a Mont Blanc. Yes, yes. That's a what about the, in India then? What's the competition in India? You don't have Mont Blanc and all that in no, India? No, India there is high uh, local production happening there. Yeah. So the pricing is at the lowest. Yes. But isn't the Pelican slightly more prestigious than the Indian It is. Brand? It is. The, what we are focusing on is certain products which are not available in India. Okay. For example, the ink eradicator product which is, was not there in India. And uh, it has, it was like you know, it has taken the whole market in India. And based on that, we are selling other product, line product, to push the brand. That's and <laughs> is this, is this other products uh, uh, having the Pelican brand or a cheaper price fighter brand? No, it's the sourcing that we do. If you want uh, to go to the other countries, the products are from Germany. Yeah. If you want to go to India, it comes from China. So if I go to India and I buy a Pelican brand and the thing breaks, I'd be scolded in the company. When actually. That can't be helped. This will be. Okay. Maybe price is an indicator of quality. Okay. Any other example you want to give? Yeah. Any of your companies? Yes? Is there a life cycle for them? There would be. There would be definitely a life cycle. Okay. I mean, everything had a life cycle. And certain brands that, I mean, you have so many examples of this. <laughs> Telefunken radios, have you ever heard of these? Grundig. These were like the prestige brands in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Go on. Right. Gucci, yes. But there are what is called brand brand swapping. Like you have, for example, for the uh, the crocodile Lacoste shirt. Okay, now it's a perfume. Okay, Pierre Cardin, which this actually suit is, is now selling toilet bowls. Right. I don't know what that does to esteem value of Pierre Cardin, but they do they do uh, sort of spread that esteem in one into yeah. other product ranges as well. But after some time, of course, these things do have a, have a problem. Everything would have a life cycle. Any other questions? OK, so you can see that all of these concepts are very much part of our pricing exercise. Now, lastly, we have harvesting, which I've already talked about. They generally use when one wants to abandon a product, which is simply stopping production. One could put it to affect a large across the board price increase. So remember, I told you about the Sony PlayStation 2 versus 3. If the line has been grossly underpriced, then the segment may not lose much business and may have turned a bad line into a good one, and production can resume again. Even if much market share is lost, some customers may continue to buy at a high price, and then they want to favorably dispose of one stock. In this manner, one can maximize cash flow and profit in the short run. Now, when I said that there is these sorts of extremes, okay, um, elastic demand curve, inelastic, pricing method, skimming strategy, there are companies that go against the trend. Okay, when they have a product that is an inelastic product, they may actually price it similar to what is an elastic product. And so we give a few things like this in a little while. Okay, there, there is situations and examples where they cross boundaries. So now let's look at the financial implications of pricing strategies. 
Okay. You can see that all of the bus strategies that I mentioned are basically related to market share. The value and accountant and the product manager should therefore monitor the market situation very carefully. When they recognize the prevailing market situation, then they will know what the market share objective is. And the third is the pricing strategy. And the fourth is the financial implication. So let's look at the table here. Very, very important table. I use this table very often for my own consulting work. Okay? It sort of focuses your mind. Okay, when you talk about price, do not jump immediately to the pricing decision. Okay? You must ask the first question, what is the market situation that we are encountering? You see, pricing is the third column. Are we in a growth market? Do we have or can get equal or superior competitive strength? Are we number one in the market or in a good position to take it? So if you have any of these, any or all of these, then you have no option, no option, but to go for market share. You must go for market share. Okay. So now, what do you go to for market share with? Well, of course, the familiar one is penetration. Okay, You go after market share by price penetration. Pricing at or below market depending on competitive strength. But if you have a differentiated product, you can still get market share through skin, like what? Apple's iPhone did. Now some people actually do a combination. As I told you, some people may have a product that is differentiated, but they look like they were doing penetration pricing. And the good example of this was Nintendo's V product. On that one? That was the first product that was the handheld gaming controllers that you didn't have a wire running. Okay, you could have bought that console in Australia for about 300 Australian dollars, it's about 300 US. Right. Extremely cheap for something that was completely differentiated. It, it was no other game being in console had that. Of course, they knew that the competition was coming at them for these sorts of things. But they were the first. So they could have gone for skimming with a very high price, but instead they decided no, before the competition comes in, let us go for penetration, have our console in every home, and so that when the competition comes, they won't buy it. Okay? So that's what they did. And it was a mega, mega success. I mean, you had grandmothers boxing with their children, grandchildren, so you, you can do boxing with the whole in the two consoles in chair. They had the picture of, they had a method of getting the console to have a sort of caricature or a picture of yourself of your grandmother, it's pretty close they could get to the picture and so on. It was very, very interesting. It was, there were variations with the exercise machines and all sorts of things. So that was a good good strategy because they want to get that console into the home. So even if you have a differentiated product, you may wish to do penetration in some cases. Financial implications, low profit now, high profit later, low cash flow now, especially if you are doing penetration, not the skimming. So it's a typically star or problem child wildcat product. Now what if you are number one in the market but the market is not growing and the competition is extremely strong? Then you have you should hold market share. Okay? So maintain price. So if having a differentiated product, increase the price. Now this is what iPhone is doing. Incredible competition with Google, Android, and the Samsung phone. Okay, Samsung has got a higher market share, but in markets that count, including China, mind you, iPhone is, is there. It's, it's an incredible generation of cash. That's why iPhone has become a significant cash cow. Okay, significant cash cow. So, uh, however, that pricing strategy follows from the holding market share. What if it's a dying market? In order to high computer strength, get out of the market. You may do this by discounting, which is a traditional one, but you think about harvesting, so put the price out to get out of the market. Maximum profit and cash flow in the short term. So now when you are doing your case study on this area, okay, I want you all to, there is a uh, case study where you are going to come up with a pricing decision. Please don't jump to this immediately. You've got to ask these questions. What is the market situation? 
and what is the market share option before you come to your pricing decisions. Okay, now what if you make a mistake? Risk-averse pricing strategies. Now there are two ways that you can rectify the issue or try to prevent things from happening. One is cost-oriented and the other is selling within. One is delayed quotation pricing. Especially manufacture of custom made products such as machine tools adopt this method. Under this strategy, the final price is quoted only when that item has reached the state of finished product. So if you go to in Australia, I presume same in Dubai, you go to a builder to build your house, then you say, Oh, it's going to cost you three hundred thousand dollars. Okay, but you can be sure that at the end of the day he will charge you five hundred thousand dollars. Why he said the land was not straight, that there was water seepage here, and this thing went up, and the prices went up, etc., etc. You can be sure. So this is where the final price is only after you make it. Now accountants used to be able to do this by giving the final price of an audit after the audit was finished, but no longer. They had to tender. But lawyers, they still do this. Okay, you go to a lawyer with a small problem, or oh, a simple, simple problem. Simple come, come, right? 20, 30 years later, you're still having that problem <laughs> and still paying. Okay? So, there was in fact a story I heard from an Indian student about this Indian lawyer whose son also became a lawyer. And the Indian lawyer, lawyer the old, old man, went to a hospital with some problem and the son took over the business. And very proudly, the son came and said, Oh, Dad, I finished, you know, all those cases on your table. I Clear them all out, and that old lady that you've had with for about 40, 50 years, even that I've sorted out. The father said, Oh my God, son, that old lady paid for your sister's dowry, your education, and now you've gone and, <laughs> now you've gone and solved the problem. Okay? So these are typical of lawyers. Right. So elimination of low margin products and customers, that's another cost oriented strategy. Probably using Pareto analysis or the 80 20 rule, remember the 80% to 20% rule in conjunction with ABC and custom profitability analysis could be used and harvesting can be applied. So get rid of complexity by your low margin products and customers. Another one, adoption of escalator clauses. Here prices are increased automatically based on previously agreed formula. The objective is to alleviate risk involving cost increases. The basis of escalation may be simple factors such as listed price increases of raw materials or highly complex formula that incorporates several uh, increases as cost of labor, energy, and several material inputs. Now, I was working for uh, the Australian branch of a large Sri Lankan uh, multinational uh, that was selling um, a product called activated carbon, which is made out of the coconut shell. If you actually crush the coconut, you make charcoal, then you crush it, then you put steam through the uh, the uh, uh, particles and if you activate them and what it, what it is used for is in gold mining because when you do open cut gold mining uh, you can extract the gold but there's a lot of gold still left in the soil you scoop the soil up put it into these big barrels of activated carbon and the carbon extracts the gold and then you wash it with a cyanide solution and the end product is gold okay so it is a very very good product so what we had to do was when you sold it to Australian mines, we had to say, look, if the exchange rate fluctuates, the US dollar, then we had to change the price, either up or down. But usually it was there because all we had to put the price up. And the other thing was the price of charcoal, because charcoal is a product that is sold on a like a stock exchange in Sri Lanka and many other countries. So we had to incorporate the price of charcoal also in our escalator clauses. So like that, many of you who are dealing with foreign components, okay, and so on, would have to have these sorts of clauses. Anyone, any example of any company here having an escalator clause for your, yes, what's the one? Like cable manufacturing. Right. Uh, depends on the number of prices and the change, uh, it has different the scheme of the changes uh, uh, by uh, uh, region, uh, seasonal, uh, prices, for example, in winter it goes down, in summer it goes up. Uh, it depends like that. So when you sell, we are not selling by uh, people price by meter. We are selling by uh, by ton. So uh, 
it depends on the price and the, and the, and the offer we are given. We are saying it's based on this price yeah. until this day. Okay. Then okay. it's it's a chain. So it's a chain. could it go up or down? Yeah, yeah. It can okay. go up or down. Okay. And the, and the customer knows uh, when it will go up or down. But usually he needed he needed for a project, so mm -hmm. he should use it at that time. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay, so the effective users are escalated depend on the willingness of customers to accept them. On the firm, the to change the formula over time as cost structures change and to measure variation in cost changes across products. Okay, so those are cost oriented. What about selling related? One is to unbundle your services. A major product may have been priced to include special peripheral equipment or replacement parts. By unbundling such, the sum of prices may exceed the whole single price. Okay, there, there are some companies that bundle it. That is, take for example the office uh, suite of uh, software. Early it was separate Word, separate Excel, separate PowerPoint. Right? Most people, almost all people want Word. Much lower percentage want Excel, then a very, very low percentage want PowerPoint, and the others no one really wants okay, access and so on. Okay, but if you look at it together, if everyone is buying all the products, it will be much cheaper to buy the office. But if you are only interested in, in Word or Excel, then office is actually more expensive. So, but bundling, they were able to get a higher price than individually. So the opposite of unbundling. Reduce credit and contract discounts. Because discount represents a direct reduction in gross margin earned by sellers, it's a temptation to arbitrarily eliminate many cash and quantity discounts as a means of improving margins. This is also related to price shading. Shading is when reductions on this price is made as a result of negotiation between buyers and sales. However, many firms use a one price policy to maintain gross margins, to centralize control over pricing, or to attempt to generate more sales efforts in non-price attributes of the product. So usually this reduce, eliminating discount, eliminating price shading is done because salesmen tend to not look at any other part of their job, they simply get a sale by reducing the price. So many companies have this one price policy, but really, if you take away the, the price, variation from the salesman, you are taking away a very important part of his selling arsenal. So it can be of some concern. Okay, so in summary, the pricing decision is perhaps the most important of all marketing decisions with the firm, one that needs contributing input from the accounting function. Traditionally, however, the accountant's contribution is limited to quoting manufacturing and selling costs and thus failing to consider customer reactions to different price levels and how these reactions would affect customers' purchasing decisions. So what you've seen now is that accountant can do far more than that. Okay, a very important role to play, especially looking at things such as used value, esteem value, and relative esteem, and so on, a far greater role to play in this area.